Good morning. Um, um, I think we should get started. Uh, I was told yesterday that if I talk down like this, uh, it, it's much better and you can hear better, especially in the back, so I shall try. Um, I was remembering the days when I was a lot younger and I could talk in a hall this size without a microphone at all, but those days unfortunately are long past. Um, Yesterday, we finished uh, our discussion with the uh, philosopher Montesquieu, the um, Baron de Montesquieu, and I'd like to start again with him. Uh, a man we might call today a social scientist, and he was keen uh, to reject metaphysical explanations uh, such as the intervention of a divine god. He developed some rather crazy things, a famous uh, in his day, theory of climate, in which he demonstrated a relationship between laws and national character. Uh, he concluded that climate influenced personal temperament. Cold climate, he said, has people who are young and energetic with lots of personal strength, confidence, and courage, more open and candid and with lower, um, uh, lower impulse to vengeance less suspicious of governments, and uh, their country suffer less from politics and intrigue. Whereas people in warmer climates, he said, are more timid, like us elderly people, and more sensitive to pleasure than those in colder climates. Russians, he concluded, are physically strong, not very emotional. Um, all of this uh, is an example of a, rather ridiculous today, racial attitude, which was certainly well meant in his day, but of course rings terribly today with those who've endured much of the results of such theorizing in the 20th century. Um, but it's an ex one more example of the fact that um, we need not to apply our present morality and ideas to people of, of long ago. Um, in addition to climate, he said that religion, local laws, types of government, collective, um, the collective past customs and morals all combine to influence people in a society. He praised the idea of a republic. He thought a monarch could possibly be reasonable if the monarch is constrained by established laws. But autocracy, in which one person rules based on his or her personal will and whims, this is something that's completely unacceptable. That he was read favorably by Catherine of Russia is something which continues to surprise me. But he emphasized the separation of powers with a government of uh, executive legislature and judiciary branches, work which clearly influenced uh, the men who drafted the United States Constitution. Uh, he found the English exemplary with the, the, since the monarchy was greatly constrained following the Great Revolution of 1688. Uh, without such a separation, he said, social equilibrium and true freedom are impossible. He attacked quite um, vigorously religious intolerance and based his support of tolerance on pure reason, uh, as so many people did in his century. Since the laws of the state permit multiple religions to coexist, there must be tolerance among the, uh, amongst religions. He was a strong opponent of anti-Semitism, and he described the horrible story of an 18-year-old Jewish woman who was burnt to death in an auto de fe in, in Lisbon. He created an imaginary Jewish writer who pleaded for the human right of freedom of religious practice and accused the Christian worlds of persecuting what he called God's people for their beliefs. The French Revolution was originally, originally nourished by m many of his ideas, managed to create, of course, neither liberty nor equality. 
He understood quite well that there were conflicts between physical necessities and moral obligations, and he generally believed that progress was possible. His ideals uh, were moderation and liberty. His work had great influence, I've said, on the US Constitution, on the book by Thomas Paine of the Rights of Man, and on the beginnings of the French Revolution, and on Catherine the Great, who wrote her nakaz based largely on, the, on his work. Uh, of course, Catherine was much more interested in, in, in modifying Montesquieu's ideas to protect their absolute power rather than by uh, any liberal political conventions. Um, but she did represent a change and, and improve some of the conditions in Russia, her adopted country. There is, of course, uh, a serious problem with Enlightenment thinkers that I, in general, that I keep coming back to, uh, that I consider over and over again this, this week. Uh, this problem is the assumption made by so many of them, not quite so much maybe by Montesquieu as with so many others, that conflicting views about values of freedom might somehow be resolved by the re-education of humanity. It was in thinking about such people that the man I mentioned yesterday, Isaiah Berlin, gained his insight that such social re-education projects are dangerous and that only liberal democratic policies can, feast, can peacefully house inherent conflicts in human values and that such values are in fact relevant to the cultures and the politics that engender them. So they are different for different peoples. While Montesquieu was one of the first people of his time to understand that societies uh, tended to acknowledge and hold in, in, in equilibrium the consider conflicting fields, he also maintained, as did so many of Enlightenment thinkers, that justice and law bear a, cease, uh, a serious relationship to natural law. Um, This idea, of course, supposed that the science of human psychology is one of the greatest flaws of the Enlightenment. It's easy to understand, at least for me, the attractiveness of this thinking due to the enormous uh, success of physical science in explaining how the universe works, but if this clearly has severe li limitations applied to human psychology and society. Uh, is this working better for sound? Yes. Good, okay. Um, that's enough for, for um, uh, Monsieur Montesquieu. I want to come uh, to the next thinker, um, Voltaire. One of the greatest of the writers uh, of the 18th century was Voltaire, a popularizer. His real name was Francois-Marie Arouet. Uh, he was born, as, a, as you can see here, in 1694, and he was a rather rebellious child, apparently. His father wanted him to study the law. He was determined to be a writer. Uh, his father, to ensure his, his own will, uh, wishes, sent him to The Hague in 1713, so he was uh, only 19 years old, where he worked for the French ambassador. But he fell in love and had an affair with a uh, Huguenot e exile there, an affair considered so scandalous that he was sent back to France with the, uh, within the year. Uh, shortly thereafter, he wrote a poem in which he accused the French regent, who was soon to become Louis XV, of incest. Um, this, of course, got him 11 months in the prison de Bastille. Uh, it was around 1718, shortly after his release, that he adopted the name Voltaire, uh, the origin of which is uncertain, but perhaps comes from this. Arouet um, is Arovet in Latin script, and then he adds L-I, but nobody really knows. Uh, he was a controversial writer from the beginning, uh, but be became a reasonably pro uh, popular and well-known playwright. Uh, in 1726, however, a nobleman, Voltaire was not a noble, 
and Nobleman uh, made considerable fun of the name change, and Voltaire responded by insulting the nobleman. So um, being a, a noble, he had uh, a bunch of thugs beat Voltaire up, and Voltaire then challenged him to a duel. Um, that was a mistake on his part, uh, because the nobleman then had Voltaire arrested, and he was about to be sent back to prison in the Bastille. He volunteered instead to be exiled to England, uh, and he left in 1726, staying there for three years, a period which was really crucial in his, in his career. He became quite well known there and made friends with such important people as Jonathan Swift, John Gay, and Alexander Pope, which is reasonably good company. He published two works, Letters uh, on the English and Philosophical Letters, in which he praised the English system and criticized the French. Uh, not surprising that such books were banned in his home country. Uh, he was quite the gossip in England. He read some of uh, Newton's works. Uh, Newton died in 1727, so they never met. But he was quick to publish some deeply personal comments about Newton and in Newton's life. And he uh, especially emphasized Newton's comment that he had never been with a woman, sort of the scandal of Frenchmen seems might appreciate. Um, after some three years, he was allowed back to Paris, where a clever investment and access to his father's estate after his father died quickly made him sufficiently wealthy to avoid any, um, any financial worries. In 1733, he started another affair, which lasted 16 years with a married woman who was a famous mathematician. Uh, he tried to get his work, uh, English letters, published in France. That was banned, and as a result, he was threatened with arrest. Uh, this caused him to flee to the border uh, province of Lorraine, uh, which was close, of course, to the German border. It's famous as Alsace-Lorraine went back and forth between Germany and France. Um, but it was not yet part of France, so he was safe there. And he lived in a chateau that was owned by his lover's husband, and the three of them stayed there in a sort of ménage à trois. God bless the French. Um, the two men created a library of some 21,000 books, a, a huge number at the time. Heavily influenced by his introduction to Newton's works when in England, he and his lover's husband performed many experiments on heat and mechanics. But his lover, Emile, uh, Emily de Châtelet, was so inspired and, uh, that she translated Newton's Principia into French and her version was the definitive version in, in France in, um, for some 200 years. Uh, only in the middle of the 20th century was it um, superseded, which is quite the uh, accomplishment. She was really quite a brilliant woman, well known both as a mathematician and as a physicist, adding several things to Newton, such as the first person to write the law of conservation of energy. Voltaire traveled in Belgium and Holland during the 1730s, and there he met the crown prince of Prussia, who became later Frederick the Great. By 1744, Voltaire tired both of his life in exile, and he tired of Emily, and they separated. She died, unfortunately, in late childbirth at 43 years old, uh, after which uh, Voltaire accepted an invitation to stay three years at the court of Frederick the Great in Potsdam. Uh, as the case with Catherine in Russia, uh, and Frederick and Catherine were sort of enemies, uh, Frederick had deep intellectual interests, so long as, of course, they did not uh, conflict with his reign as, as absolute ruler. Frederick had abolished torture, he had improved education, reformed the legal system, and developed commerce. Frederick, um, sorry, uh, had, in, uh, had invited the French mathematician and scientist uh, Pierre Louis Maupertuis, Maupertuis to be the director of the Prussian Academy of Sciences. Um, 
Maupetui had been a rival um, of, of Voltaire's for the love of Emily, and so there was uh, some bad feeling, of course, between the two men. Um, having a, a bit of a caustic wit, uh, Voltaire took his revenge on Maupetui with a strong and rather nasty essay, which angered Frederick so much that he ordered all copies to be burnt and soured his relationships with Voltaire. Um, so Voltaire uh, uh, offered to resign, and um, Frederick uh, accepted that and, and eventually allowed him to leave Prussia. Uh, the idea that you couldn't leave a place without the, the uh, emperor's permission is sort of difficult to understand. Um, He wanted to return to Paris by the end of 1753, uh, but uh, Louis XV, whom he had insulted, banned him from resulting. So he went to Geneva instead, uh, and he bought an estate just across the border from Geneva in an area French today, but then not under the control of the French king. It's a village that was called Fernay, but is now called Ferney Voltaire, and uh, I actually lived there for a while when I worked at CERN. Uh, there's a picture. I, I didn't live in that place. <laughs> um, but I had a friend who lived in the carriage house on the estate. Well, you can see he didn't want for money. And he had lots of distinguished guests. There are people such as James Boswell, Adam Smith, to my surprise, Giacomo Casanova, Edward Gibbon and the American Benjamin Franklin. He considered poetry the best way to uh, educate the general public, and he wrote a long poem on the dreadful earthquake that, des des that destroyed most of Lisbon on the 1st of November in 1745, followed, of course, as so ha often happens, by a great tidal wave. This was the one instance in the Enlightenment uh, era when an historical event became the subject of philosophical dispute, a time when God himself was put on trial. And Voltaire used this dreadful event when in 1759 he published Candide, the book for which he's best known today. This satire on the optimistic determination, uh, 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 determinism of Leibniz is of course a classic and the phrase, the best of all possible worlds, has become a classic. Um, it, is not, uh, it was not until 1778 that he was able finally to return to Paris. Louis XV had died a few years earlier, and uh, Voltaire was treated as a returning hero. But the trip from Geneva um, took five days. It takes under three hours now. Um, and um, he became quite ill. He recovered for a little time, uh, but he became ill again, and then he died on the 30th of May in 1778. To be buried, his body had to be taken out of pa Paris for, some, uh, for burial at some distance. However, after the revolution, he was considered a great hero. His remains brought back to Paris, uh, and he was interred amongst the French greats in the Pantheon. The ceremony was an enormous one with a full orchestra, and even in those days, an estimated million people snaking through Paris. Is it? Is it okay? Thanks. Um, I, I want to given time, I want to skip one, one thinker who's not so important. Um, the next person I want to consider is uh, Claude Adrien Helvetius, born in 1753. So I will skip this guy. There's a picture of Hel Helvetius. Um,
This thing is probably the easiest. Helvetius uh, came from a family that was originally from Switzerland and, and uh, named, not surprisingly, Schweitzer. Uh, but when they moved to France, they changed it to the Latin version of, of Schweitzer, which is Helvetius. Or, uh, the family were all physicians, and Claude de Radirin himself and his grandfather were both physicians, the first people to actually use Ipecac, Ipecac to induce vomiting when necessary. By 1738, he was appointed to a government position that paid him a considerable uh, salary, and he seems to have enjoyed himself by indulging his literary and artistic tastes, uh, plus being considerably charitable as well. But of course, there was a considerable intellectual spirit, and he was um, envious of Voltaire in poetry and Montesquieu in philosophy. His philosophical work, which he published, called uh, De l'Esprit, of the Spirit, caused a great sensation, mostly in a very negative sense. It was heavily criticized by the man then Dauphin, the, the son of Louis XV, who later, of course, became Louis XVI. The Sorbonne condemned the book. Priests call it full of the most dangerous heresies. And the hangman, again, the idea that there's a public hangman is remarkable. He publicly burned nearly all of the copies. Um, Helvetius had to give up uh, his position, but the virulence of the attacks made it all the more widely read, and it was translated into most of European languages. It was attacked by Voltaire, who caused it, called it full of commonplace thoughts, and anything in, original in it was false. Rousseau said that his wealthy lifestyle gave the lie to the book. Others thought that all his ideas came from Diderot. But also, it was claimed that he expressed openly what many others uh, thought in private. His philosophy is what part of what is called today utilitarianism. It claims that on everything we experience, um, in, is reduced to physical sensation, even memory and judgment. We differ from lower animals only in our organizational skills. He also said that self-interest, the pre preference for pleasure over pain, is the sole source of judgment, action, and affection. Uh, there are no absolutes, and the ideas of justice and injustice change due to the customs of a given society. And finally, he says that all intellects are equal and we owe everything to education. And this latter is the only truly original idea in his thinking, which is not unreasonable, of course, in, in light of both experience and scientific investigation. But the most important thinker in utilitarianism, and in a much more profound sense than Helvetius, was John Stuart Mill about a century later. Um, but Helvetius died in 1771, uh, too early to see uh, the revolution. A major figure of the 18th century that I want to talk about next is Jean Laurent d'Alembert, certainly one of the finest mathematicians of that century, who, uh, which had a considerable number of great mathematicians. Uh, he began his life as a, uh, as a foundling. He was exposed near the church of Saint Jean Le Rond in Paris, hence where his name of Jean de Le Rond. He added the d'Alembert himself as an adult. His father, unknown uh, to him, was really a nobleman and without disclosing himself, settled uh, an anonymous annuity on the boy. Uh, D'Alembert's immense knowledge of mathematics was gained on his own after he left school. He made attempts to work at the law and in medicine, but math soon occupied him full time. He became a member of the French Academy of Science, uh, 
at age 24 based on some excellent work in both the integral calculus and fluid mechanics. But just three years later, he published what is now called D'Alembert's Principle and the D'Alembertian in, um, and, and I know there are some physics people here, so I will sneak in a little physics. Um, he restated Newton's laws in a way to make calculations much simpler. This is known, he introduced what's called the principle of virtual work, and it reduces the problem of dynamics, forces, accelerations, to a problem of statics, objects at rest and in balance. This greatly simplifies many difficult calculations. His mathematical genius was truly exceptional, and to this day, it is well remembered with what is called the D'Alembertian. For those of you who can read that. Uh, in this area of the Enlightenment, he worked with Diderot in creating the Encyclopedia, yet another huge contribution on his part. He published a major work called The Elements of Philosophy in 1759, in which he discussed the principles and methods of various sciences. His evidence in music is evident, uh, and he wrote an Elements of, of the Theory and Practice of Music from 1779, which was based upon a system originally proposed by the composer Jean-Philippe Rameau. His fame spread throughout Europe, and he was offered a lot of positions, including the head of the Prussian Academy of Science by Frederick the Great, and additionally, the tutor to Catherine the Great's son at a yearly salary of 100,000 francs, which was a huge amount. All of these he declined. David Hume left him 200 pounds in his will. D'Alembert, however, continued to live a frugal life in Paris, supported his foster mother, educated the children of his first teacher, and helped various poor and undeserving students. He died a very famous man in 1783. The last Frenchman I wish to discuss is Marie Jean Antoine Nicolet Cantat, the Marquis de Condorcet, generally, of course, just known as Condorcet. He's the youngest of those we've considered and a truly major figure. Isaiah Berlin, who might, he's still on. Oh, whatever you need to do. Okay, we hope that's better. Um, Isaiah, um, where was I? Yeah, Isaiah Berlin called him the father of all liberalism and all radicalism in Europe, and that reading Condorcet's idea of a secular state moved him to tears. Whatever works. Uh, he began his maturity with outstanding work in mathematics, but he was far too interested in a wide variety of areas to be a specialist. Apparently a genial soul and a friend of most of the distinguished people of his time, D'Alembert and, and Voltaire amongst them. He worked on the encyclopedia with, with D'Alembert, but many publications, especially for the Academy of Sciences, gained him a, a reputation as a graceful and elegant writer, and he was elected as the permanent secretary uh, of the Academy of Sciences in 1777, and elected to the French Academy in 1782. He was also a member of the academies of Turin, St. Petersburg, Bologna, and Philadelphia, quite the distinguished list. His Life of Voltaire, published in 1787, was widely read and gained him even more fame. But uh, a political tempest, of course, was breaking in France, and he was certainly caught up in that. He greeted the revolution with great enthusiasm as the advent of democracy, and he wrote many pamphlets suggesting re re reforms, 
and new constitutions. He had a special interest in education, and his writings on stage state education eventually became the foundation for the French system of natural, national education, which is, still exists today. Uh, Louis XVI fled in June of 1792, and Condorcet was one of the first to declare in favor of a republic. <coughs> but this alienated him from many of his former friends, and in particular from the Jac Jacobians, uh, and he was attacked. Um, no, uh, he was attached to no political group. But he was elected to the to the convention in 1793. He objected on principle to the death penalty, and voted the king guilty of conspiring against liberty and word worthy of any penalty short of death. But the onset of the terror, his severe criticism of the assembly at the time, and its harsh constitution, led him to being accused of conspiring against the republic. Uh, he was then condemned. Friends sought asylum for him in the house of a good friend, Madame Vernet, but she was a remarkable woman who said, let him come and lose not a moment, for while we talk, he may be seized. The Chekhovians and, and Robespierre gaining power led to the creation, to the execution of Danton and the Girondists. This then Condorcet to believe that his prot protectress, Madame Vernet, was also in terrible danger, and he resolved to, to find refuge elsewhere. He's quoted as saying, I am outlawed, and if I am discovered, you will meet the same sad end as myself. Her reply, however, is famous. The, um, it does not, of course, have the power to put itself. You will stay, she said. And she had him carefully watched so uh, he could not flee. Um, his wife and Madame Vernet then prevailed upon him to write what has become probably his most famous work the sketch of a historical picture on the progress of the human spirit. Continuing to be concerned for the safety of Madame Vernet, he managed eventually to escape. <coughs> but he could not find even a night's um, safety at, at the or shelter at the, ho at the homes of other friends, and so he had to hide for several days in a nearby forest. Finally, on the 7th of April in 1794, soak, with soaking wet and with torn garments, bleeding from a wound on his leg, he entered a tavern where he was immediately arrested. He was cast into a cold, damp cell uh, and was found dead there the following morning. Whether he died from exhaustion or was poisoned is not known. But his last writings, um, says that the characteristic features of the future would be the destruction of inequality between nations, the destruction of in, uh, inequality between classes, and the improvement of individuals, the indefinite perfectibility of human nature, intellectually, morally, and physically. He was a firm believer in, uh, in the equality of freedom and human rights. His wife, was 20 years his junior and was left suddenly penniless by his death. She had to support herself, her younger sister, and her four-year-old daughter. But she must have been a remarkable woman because she not only managed, but at the end of the terror, she published a translation of one of Adam Smith's works, some writings of her own, and as much of her husband's works as she could. Under Napoleon's consulate, and the later empire, her salon became a famed meeting place. <coughs> of course, the Enlightenment was not just a French effort. Uh, as we have seen, many of the French spent some time in Britain, and the movement was in fact far from just an English thing. The contributions from Scotland uh, were at least as great and probably greater, but surely, uh, to start with the British, I want to start with John Locke, 
a man who spent most of his life actually in the 17th century rather than this 18th. He was born back in 1632, just a few months before Spinoza. He grew up in a rural community. He was taught at home by his father, but eventually wound up at Oxford. Um, at Oxford, he met uh, the uh, first Earl of Shaftesbury, who became, he became his private secretary, and he settled in London for the next 15 years. This connection gave him the freedom to think and write, and the entire middle of his life was spent thus. He's, uh, it brought him into contact with many thinkers, allowed him to join the, the Royal Society, and, uh, and, and eventually to write his greater, greatest work, The Essays Concerning Human uh, Understanding. There's a picture of him. Uh, political uh, intrigue was certainly rife at this time as the image, as the reign of Charles II due to a, a close. Shaftesbury fell from grace in 1675, which caused Locke to flee, and he headed to France where he alternated for three years between Paris and Montpellier. Um, he met a lot of interesting people there. The one who interests me the most is the Danish astronomer uh, Ola Romer, the first person to make a real measurement of the speed of light, which he did by looking at the planet Io. If we had a little more time, I'd show you how he did that. Um, but he did that back in, in the 17th century um, and got a remarkably close number. I tried to repeat that um, about 30 years ago and, and couldn't get as good a result as he got, to my embarrassment. Um, Shaftesbury was returned to power in 1679, and then Locke returned to London. Uh, but this was a, a powerful time of plots and counterplots. Charles' reign was ending. The Catholic James II was coming to power. The glorious revolution of 1688 brought William and Mary to the throne. So these were troubling years, and Locke did his best to stay away from trouble. In 1683, he left again, this time for Holland, the asylum of many people looking for a place to breathe freely and exercise the, the opinion there. Um, this was, of course, the home of, of uh, Erasmus the, the, and Spinoza. Uh, De Descartes was there, had taken refuge there. Uh, the Dutch, of course, had paid an enormous price by fighting uh, Philip II and, and the Duke of Alba to gain such freedom. Uh, by 1689, after the Glorious Revolution, Locke was able to return to London, and by this time his writings had made him quite famous. Uh, the foul air of London, however, aggravated his asthma, and he left to live, live in Essex at the home of Lord Masham, a place that became his real home and gave him the peace to continue to write. He continued to write, and his fame increased greatly, especially as the essay concerning human understanding gained much international acclaim. Uh, it was translated into French and then eventually into Latin, which meant it, it was read everywhere in the learned world. He tried really hard to separate the Christianity of Jesus' time uh, and, and preaching from the uh, accretions of dogma added to it by centuries of various church editions. He had a deep repugnance to believing blindly in anything that rested on arbitrary authority as distinguished uh, from what was to be seen by self-evident reason or by demonstration or by good prob uh, probable evidence. There were some remarkable people in this time. Um, then uh, words from the essay, which I want to, to copy in the next three slides, which are somewhat longer. Um, the notions that would, whatever you please to call them would If you can read some of that, we have occasion to examine the reasons and degrees uh, degrees of assent. 
Uh, this is his most famous work and one of the most famous works of the um, English, um, uh, English Renaissance. Um, he postulated that at birth, we are born with a completely empty mind, Latin words that have become famous for that tabula rasa. Now, we know that this is not true because genetics uh, implants um, numerous things in the brain as it develops in utero. Of course, he couldn't know this, uh, and he postulated that knowledge is gained by experience and that the, this comes via sense perception. Um, teaching physics for lots of years, I'm well aware of how much experience through sense perception makes an understanding basic science difficult for so many people. The idea that words such as energy or momentum bring to people's minds are very f are numerous and far different from what science means by them. What Locke has done is to create the philosophical ideas that are today known as empiricism. Locke was a man of gentle, shy, and amiable disposition, widely liked and esteemed, without enemies, and apparently endowed with an astonishing capacity for absorbing and interpreting in simple language some of the original and revolutionary ideas in which his time was, of course, singularly rich. He's truly the father of, many th many th of much thought in the Western world, and especially in the 18th century thought in America. Descartes, who did so much um, to liberate thought from medieval thinking, only recognizes as worthy of attention those arguments which proceed by, rent, by rigorous deduction from premises which are self-evident or known to be true a priori. This is a philosophy called rationalism. But Locke appeals to observations of the natural world, and he seeks to examine beliefs and states of mind by tracing them to psychological origins, his the invention, as I've said, of empiricism. He's the first writer to emphasize introspection, observing one's own emotions and behaviors. Above all, like, uh, like uh, Thomas Hobbes, Locke looks on human beings as objects in nature not fundamentally different from other natural objects. Locke's political theories were based on what is called social contact theory. Like Hobbes, he believed that human nature allowed people to be selfish. Like Hobbes, uh, Locke assumed that people established a civil society to resolve conflicts in a peaceful way with help from government in a state of society. Unlike Hobbes, however, Locke believed that human nature is characterized by reason and tolerance. He advocated the government separation of powers and believed that revolution is not only a right but an obligation in some cir circumstances. In a natural state, all people are equal and independent, and everyone had a natural right to defend what he calls life, health, liberty, or possessions. And these ideas have come to have a profound influence in the United States Declaration of Independence, and where the phrase life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is attributed to his influence on Thomas Jefferson. <coughs> Locke tempered the absolutism of Hobbes uh, and clearly separated the idea of church and state. He had a strong influence on Voltaire, uh, and his arguments concerning liberty and social contract influenced the writings in America of Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, in one passage from his um, one of his treatises uh, is, re repro uh, is reproduced verbatim in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, uh, a term of the long train of abuses. Um, Thomas Jefferson called him one of the three great thinkers uh, of the recent past. Locke 
uh, redefined subjectivity or the idea of the individual and the self and the intellectual historians argue that Locke's essay concerning human understanding marks the beginning of the modern Western conception of the self. Locke's theory of association heavily influenced the subject matter uh, of modern psychology. Uh, at the time, the empirist philosophers rec recognition of two types of ideas, of simple and complex ideas, more importantly, their interaction through association inspired other philosophers, such as David Hume and George Berkeley, to revise and expand his theory and apply it to explain how humans gain knowledge in the physical world. Locke, writing his letters concerning toleration in the aftermath of the European wars of religion, formulated a classic um, reasoning for religious top tolerance. These are the following three slides. Earthly judges, um, cannot dependably evaluate the truth claims of various religious statements. Enforcing a true religion would not have belief cannot be compelled by violence, something we, we humans have not seemed to learn. Um, many of his ideas have come to us today as sensible and reasonable with their influence uh, on our time and modern ideas uh, are self-evident. Here are some more examples of his ideas. I rather like that. I, I've not tried the latter. Uh, yeah, a academia is, um, I think, one of the great professions and a real joy, but it, and it makes you wealthy in every way except money. Um, he, he, he died uh, in 1704. He's buried in Essex, where his gravesite is much visited. Um, and this is, this is written on his tomb. Uh, the next man I wish to consider is uh, George Barclay, another example of the remarkable people uh, who populated the 18th century. He was born in Ireland in 1685, but spent most of his of life in that country, which was, of course, part of Great Britain in those days. He was a brilliant young man who wrote most of his works before 30. He taught at Trinity College Dublin until 1725, when he conceived the idea of a college in Bermuda for tra training missionaries. This caused him to move to Newport, Rhode Island in the US for three years. He was an earlier, early benefactor of Yale University, the fourth university uh, founded in the United States in 1701. Um, my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, was the fifth such, founded in 1740 by Benjamin Franklin. He returned to Ireland in 1731, and there he was appointed the Bishop of Cloyne three years later, and so is generally known as Bishop Barclay, although he was um, and he was there until 1732 when he retired to Oxford, where he died a year later. Uh, he was universally admired and seemed to have had no enemies. There's Locke's tomb. Uh, it, it's quite remarkable that this was put up by the Americans as is the tomb of, uh, or is, is a part of the tomb of Isaac Newton, uh, also done not by the English or the British, but by the Americans. Anyway, there's a picture of Mr. Bar of Bishop Barclay. Um, he was considered a, a bridge between the common sense of Locke and the skepticism of Hume. 
That's not completely true. He was an empiricist, like Locke, in the sense that he tried to find a coherent relationship and a direct verification between outer and inner worlds with the involvement of, the, uh, of metaphysics. But he was quite different in many ways. Uh, Hobbes and Locke were both under the very strong influence of the scientific revolution uh, from uh, following Newton. Hobbes tried to use a scientific me method for fields of ethics and politics, uh, which obviously we know today does not succeed. Locke was much more cautious, but he also tried to reconcile scientific findings with common sense. Having struggled with generations of students who tried to apply common sense to Newtonian physics, uh, I can testify to the virtual impossibility of such a task. Locke is, in truth, the follow of all, father of all those who tried to explain in plain English the problems of science, many of which can only be understood in the language of mathematics. Berkeley's position as a Christian bishop and true believer is directly opposed to many of the views of Hobbes and Locke. Um, in one sense, uh, he has a, a ruth or had a ruthlessly empirical point of view in that nothing can exist independent of our experience of it. Yet for him, the world uh, is a place of continuous spiritual life, first in the mind of God and then in the minds of his creatures, human beings. For him, nothing exists except spiritual activity, the creative power process of God's infinite spirit and the finite souls of mankind. It's human experience, imagination, memory, thoughts, ex expectations, dreams, feelings, sensations. These are the real external world. That's what I mean when I say that, that Berkeley is ruthlessly empirical. What you see is, in fact, what is. Objects either go into or out of existence depending on whether a mind is perceiving them. You can see that people made great fun of him by saying, if I turn my back, you all go away. Um, but the continued existence of objects is ensured by the fact that they are in the continuous perception of God. One of Berkeley's greatest wishes is to confute the materialistic physics uh, so strongly present in Newton's works. In physics, there is a, a uh, difference between the quantitative and qualitative aspects of, of objects between things that can be described mathematically, such as their velocity and acceleration, with, uh, and things such as their appearance in our eyes. For Locke, deeply influenced by Newton, there's a struggle to maintain such uh, different aspects in his philosophy. But Berkeley destroys much of Locke's argument by creating a basis for separating objective from subjective. And such ideas have become really important for lots of thinkers to follow, um, such as Hume, John Stuart Mill, Ernst Mach, and Bertrand Russell among them. One argument against his thinking that people have used is that, of course, if everything is ideas, then we eat ideas, drink ideas, wear ideas as clothing, all of which are absurd. And Berkeley was well aware of this issue because he complains that we are substi substituting ideas for material objects. He points out uh, th that uh, we have reduced the word bread to an idea, having the Id uh, leaving the idea, the act of eating uh, and body um, uh, as real in contrast to illusory bread. But uh, Lenin uh, adopted this and was famous for repeating such arguments in much cruder form. Uh, the idea, the last of the great thinkers I w want to consider, and, and we won't finish with today, uh, is David Hume. In an essay about, one of, uh, about him from, more, again, one of my favorite sources, Isaiah Berlin, I found the following remark. 